What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Healthcare Hustle Podcast. Today, we are joined by Trevor Brand, Chief Operating Officer of Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Trevor, welcome to the show. I appreciate you, fellas. Been uh, looking for looking forward to this for a while. Had it circled on the calendar, so I uh, was excited when I uh, got the initial initial contact. I've actually been watching the podcast for a while, and I, I called Brandon one day, like, "Hey, man, are you, you just not wanting me to be on the podcast?" So. <laughs> But I'm just, just kidding, but really been excited about this. Appreciate it. Well, we'll blame Brandon for waiting this long to get you on the podcast, <laughs> but we're definitely excited to have you here today. Well, we'll kick it off as we always do. Trevor, could you could you start us off with your journey? Like start us when you where you were from, how all that kind of came through, and what got you into healthcare? Yeah, yeah. So uh, originally from, from right outside of Nashville, Tennessee, a small town called Dixon's, about 45 miles west, west of the of the city, um, I, I got into healthcare for a couple reasons. One, my, my mom was a was an LPN, my pretty much my my entire life. Um, so I got to see some of the things that, that she got to go through. Uh, really got an appreciation for the nursing field and, and what they do and what they provide for healthcare. Uh, but at the same time, uh, like like many like many people, especially of, of color, I've had to deal with fa several family members that have had just access issues with 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 healthcare. So I'll give the one example of my, my grandfather who uh, unfortunately passed of, of prostate cancer, but I, I, I tell many people, I don't, I don't know if it was the, the cancer that killed him or the lack of access that did. Um, and in many cases I feel, and we all know this, prostate cancer is one of the most probably preventable and treatable types of cancers, uh, but much like, uh, much like many uh, unfortunate men that, that deal with that cancer type, they either find out too late because they didn't have the access early on um, or they don't have the access to continue those to continue those services. Uh, that's something I wanted to I wanted to change. Um, but it's, it's really why I got into into healthcare. A combination of really a lot of family influences, but um, couldn't be more happy to be a part of the industry today. Uh, really, how I got how I got into it from a professional standpoint after uh, college. Uh, so I graduated from Austin P State with my undergrad in healthcare. Uh, did grad school at, at Georgia State. But while I was in grad school. I was actually working at, a, at an enterprise rental car, so nothing to do with healthcare at all. So shout out, shout out to Enterprise for all the cars they made me wash and a suit and all that, all that fun stuff. But um, it was it's interesting enough. I was um, renting a car one day. The woman that came that came in and happened to be a, a CEO for the for the health centers just just across town. I uh, told her, Hey, I'm I'm in grad school. I, I just want a, a chance. I've been interviewing and. Uh, applying to literally over 150 places, didn't get a call back. I just, I just want a shot. Uh, she hired me the next week to come in and do some uh, outreach and, and marketing work with a population um, that didn't traditionally have access. So it's kind of full circle to why I wanted to get into the field. But I say that's really what helped uh, jumpstart my career. Uh, and then from there, did a fellowship and, and went that route, and then uh, kind of went up the, went up the chain through, through that. But uh, ultimately joined because of uh, family influences, but but stayed because of just the potential that healthcare has and what I what I hope that we can accomplish. Oh wow! I think that uh, resonates with me for so uh, many different reasons. Number one, I'm actually a graduate of Fisk University in Nashville, currently in Nashville yeah, yeah. right now. So when I was looking up your you know history, I was like, oh Austin P. I got a couple of uh, friends that graduated from there, but. Yeah. Um, also, just too, I think you work in an enterprise, and like we said before, you know, we were even recording you just being hungry and having the ability to, you know, just ask and kind of put yourself out there. One of my questions is, what was the experience early on that instilled the confidence in you that, you know, no matter what it is, I'm going to achieve what I want to achieve within this industry? Yeah, I think some of it was I, I didn't have a I didn't have a choice. Um, I, I got married earlier in life and, and had a daughter pretty quickly after I got married. So I had to make a choice. Um, am, am I going to be that person that, that, you know, can't take care of my family? Um, or am I going to go out and figure out how to make, how to make things work? So I think my daughter and my wife played a big part of that. Uh, some of that is also just, just things instilled for me from my, from my father I, 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 and my mother. I, I grew up with, with very humble beginnings, like a, like a lot of people where there were many times that, you know, bills didn't just get paid easily. That's that's something I heard my parents talk about often, and sometimes we would see lights go out and, and things like that. But I, I had to see my parents every day get up and, and figure out a way to make it happen. So I, I think a lot of that was just uh, me learning from my parents early on that um, despite what your 
problems are, despite where your challenges are, you still got to figure out a way to make it happen. Um, so I credit my parents and then having a family early on kind of catapulted me in figuring out what do I need to do to be better? How can I be better? Because I think at the end of the day, I want to be a, a role model for my family and for other people that uh, are, are trying to come along this journey as well. So uh, I'd say those those couple things really help instill some of that confidence. And some of it, to be honest, is it, it's um, through trial and error. Um, I've, I've made much more mistakes than I have successes. So um, it's me failing and failing early, which I, I think is probably most important. Um, nobody likes failure, but one thing you learn from failure is, is A, how not to do it, and, and two, how to pivot from that from that failure. So I've had enough of those to where um, I, I've, I've kind of created a list of here's what I shouldn't be doing. Um, and I think that some of that's given me the confidence to to, to jump in and do things because I know what failure feels like um, and I know how to pivot when that, when that happens. I, I think those are, those are great lessons. Uh, you talked about your parents kind of being a good influence on you. Was there a mentor or, or anyone like that as you were going through both your university experiences that kind of helped set you on the path that you're on now? Yeah, I've, I've had several mentors and I, I can't, I don't think I can say how important it is for, one, mentors, but two, even more than, than mentors, it's sponsors. Um, and I think both are equally important, but I know you both know the difference, but mentors are someone that helps you with knowledge and learning things. Sponsors are really someone that puts their neck on the line and says, this person can, can do the job. But um, I actually met one mentor of mine who's, who's now a great colleague, but uh, he, was, he was sitting outside wearing a fraternity shirt, and I'm in, I'm in the same fraternity, and just said, Hey, how are you? How are you doing? What What are you doing on my campus wearing that shirt? And uh, from from there, it, it really uh, struck a, a really good relationship. He's a big reason I uh, got to meet some of the other mentors that I have. But uh, I mean, I can name people like Jossie Chisley, uh, Jonathan Watkins, uh, a lot of really high powered high powered people that I've had an opportunity to be mentor that have also become sponsors. Uh, one of those I named Jonathan Watkins. I report to him today. Um, I reported to Jossie in the past, so not only were they mentors, but they were also sponsors of me. Uh, but mentorship, I, I would say, in, in large part, has, has really helped me get to where I am, qu quite literally, as, as many of them has given me opportunities to advance in my career. Mm. Wow, that's, you know, key, and I think it's beautiful that, you know, you were able to have working relationships, you know, with your mentors as well. Some of us, you know, aren't as lucky, but I think when you can develop those relationships and people can really see you grow, you know, day-to-day -day basis, I think that's powerful. One of the things I could already kind of imagine some of the wisdom, but but one of the things that I'd be curious about is as you were making these transitions, um, because, you know, some would say you've had a very accelerated right uh, career trajectory. Um, how was just your thought process as you were making these transitions, you know, going from an enterprise to a manager position at a health system to then being a fellow, then to all of a sudden, you know, having a title where you're directly, you know, uh, sitting next to, you know, a folk that's a chief or, you know, that's a vice president. What was kind of your mindset? How'd you keep yourself grounded as you were making these transitions? Man, I'll be honest, each time I do it, and I don't know if I've gotten better at it. Um, I just, I just learned to kind of, understand that I to feel what I'm feeling in, in the moment. But each each time I've been I've been terrified, to be completely honest. With every promotion I've been fairly terrified because I'm going into unknown, unknown waters. Uh, going from enterprise directly into into healthcare, I, I'd gotten comfortable. I know how to rent a car. I could I could do that with my eyes closed. I didn't know anything about about healthcare. Um, so I was I was scared each time, uh, nervous about it. But what, what I've done is I've really had a knack for asking questions. Um, and it's, what are my expectations? What, what do you expect of me in this role? Um, what do you expect in a person that you believe is, is high level? What are some things that you did in your career to get to you, get you to where you are? Um, and I've, I've been deliberate on saying, here's what I want to do in my career. Um, I've, I've been very upfront with any mentor I have, any person that employs me and tell them, hey, eventually I want to be a health system CEO. What should I be doing every day in order to get to that level. And I think I've been able to um, really learn a lot from those conversations. I understood what was expected of me. Um, and that helps kind of calm some things because again, when you're going into unknown territory, unknown waters, it can be kind of scary. But if someone hands you a, a oar and says, here's how you paddle this boat in unknown waters, 
makes you have some ease to the situation. So I think asking questions, being inquisitive, um, really doing what I have to do to learn as much as possible. Um, and then again, I'll say it again, figure out what not to do and uh, pivot from the times that you have, have a failure. But with every promotion, you're gonna have things that maybe you don't do well, maybe you don't do correctly, but how are you surrounding yourself with the resources that do know how to do it? Or how are you making sure that you develop the tools that you need or have to, to, get, the, to get the job done? But uh, circling back, I mean, uh, how have I felt each time I've had a transition? I've, I've, been, I've been scared. It's, uh, it's, uh, it can be scary. I think it'll continue to be scary, but it's, it's what am I doing to, one, I need to feel that. And I, I think sometimes we don't take enough time to uh, feel what we need to feel but also how quickly can I get out of that and make sure that I'm moving in the right direction. I, I think admitting that that was scary is such a, such a huge piece that a lot, no, I don't always take enough advantage of, I don't know about you, Winston, um, but you always hear people talk about like, Oh, I was ready. I got it. It was, it was meant to be. Um, so I think it's really big and awesome of you to admit that these big transitions can be, can be kind of scary and we don't always know what's on the other side. Um, but having the tools is, is key to being successful as we navigate these transitions. I'd love to hear kind of staying on the same note, maybe the opposite side of it, as you made some of these transitions, was there anywhere where you, where you fumbled the ball, um, where, where it didn't quite go as well as you were expecting? I, I think people can learn a lot from those things. Yeah, I, look, I've, um, the big thing about, and I played, I played football, so I, I love the analogy behind fumble the ball. Uh, there's plenty of times I've fumbled it, but what you got to make sure of when you fumble it, you also got to recover the ball. Yep. Um, so I, I've, I've, I've fumbled a few times. I, I'll give this example. When I first became a, a COO, it's my first time doing anything at that at that level. I've, I've led teams. I've led, you know, individuals. I haven't led a hospital. That, that was my first time doing that. And, you know, I had the knowledge base developed to do it. But I, I'd say that what I really needed to develop was the leadership portion. A lot of people get mistaken when you get into this chief operating officer role that my job is to do everything in the hospital. When In fact, it's to empower my leaders to make the decisions, to make the changes that they need to make. And early on, I was trying to make all the decisions. I was trying to do the, the fixing and the changing, the wheeling and dealing. So I'd have meetings with directors and they'd tell me what their thoughts are. And I'd say, here's the, here's the path we're going. Here's the decisions we're making. Where in many times, again, I'm a young leader. I've never done it before. I'm a smart guy, don't, don't get me wrong, but I don't know everything about a particular department. When what I could have done was say, hey, you're the expert in this. Let's put a plan together. Let's understand what's going on. Let's implement these things um, and, and really work on it that way. I think, I think in the beginning, I was much more authoritarian uh, really that, than I was, uh, I'll say participative, but it's, it's giving your leaders the, the opportunity and the space to lead. Uh, so I'd, I'd say early on, I, I fumbled through that. So my, my first three, four months was a struggle until I figured out there's people I can rely on. Um, I'm not the only person that makes the hospital run. And, and in fact, there's a lot more on the front lines, uh, the director group, the managers. They're really what makes the hospital run. But what am I doing to empower them and give them the resources to make it happen? So I, I'd say that's one big, big fumble for me. I could probably do this for days, but I'd, I'd leave... Uh, I'd leave that fumble. So I think the important part was I fumbled it, but we recovered the fumble. No, uh, that's that's beautiful. And I think um, you kind of actually literally uh, spoke about something, already addressed a question that I was going to ask was, you know, now that you're at the COO level, which, you know, for a lot of people is a major aspiration, I think for just, you know, young professionals, young careers, a lot of times we kind of see that position as something to really aspire to a major goal. So you kind of already spoke about how your leadership style has evolved, you know, um, since you started, how do you remain fresh? How do you, you know, continue to be that executive that really has the buy-in from folks that's connected and that people feel like, oh, Trevor's someone that not only we can trust, but it's a pleasure to work with and work for. Yeah, I, can, I continue to I continue to learn. I continue to ask questions. So the, the thing is, I, I might be at a, at a chief level role, but I'll always keep that same inquisitive mindset that I had as a, as a, as a fellow. Um, because the thing is, things evolve over time. Leadership evolves over time. If I, if I were to use the same leadership structure that leaders used 20 years ago, I may not be as effective. Um, so I do a lot of reading on effective leaders, effective leadership styles. I talk with a lot of people that I believe to be good leaders. Uh, Jonathan, who I report to now, I talked about was one of my mentors. He'll tell you often, I walk into his office and say, hey, you've seen this before. 
what are your thoughts on how you handle this particular situation? How would you lead in this in this way? Um, I'm, I'm not too big to admit, I don't know everything. I don't know most of what I need to know in order to do the role effectively. But what I do understand is how to ask questions. How can I learn and how can I, how can I pivot? I think one big thing about, about leadership is uh, we're all gonna have to figure out how to grow. We're gonna have to figure out how to, how to be better. And, want, and understanding the real role of a leader is to empower. It's not to direct all of the time. There's gonna be times you have to make decisions, but um, empowerment is something that has to develop because you're gonna have different groups of people that you have to empower. And you'll, you'll, you'll both probably appreciate this. It's a little different trying to empower the Gen Z or the uh, millennial than it is the baby boomer. So if we don't learn how to pivot within those different age groups, we're doing ourselves a disservice and we're doing our people a disservice. And in healthcare, when you're doing both of those a disservice, you're now doing your patient a disservice. So it's you got to figure out how to really empower different groups of, of people. Yeah, I think that's key. Um, and kind of kind of leads into my my first my big question about this was just gonna be how's your first year as COO been? I mean, it's been it's been right around that time, I think, since you transitioned from your previous role. Um, you, we talked her before the podcast started about we're both turning 30 this year. You talked a little bit about some of the lessons you've had. Do you feel like you're in a place now where you're you're kind of getting it and you're ready to rock and roll? Or is there still kind of more to to chew off and grow as you as you learn this new position? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. So I'm I'm in my first year of being a COO at this site. I was a COO for about a year and a half at my at my previous site. And what I'll tell you is, um, uh, I learned a lot. Do I do I think I have the position? I understand most of the makings of it, but um, I don't think I'll ever say I've got it um, because I want to continue to develop. Um, it's it's kind of like, and I see the I see the Kobe poster behind you. We we'd all agree Kobe probably had it at year 19. But did he stop practicing? No, he still showed up to practice. He still got up early to figure it out. Why? Because there's always, if you're here, you can be, you can become better. You can get better. You can learn new things. So to answer your question, do I have it? Do I got it at this point? No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, am I better than where I was two and a half years ago when I first got into the role? Yeah, I'm, I'm better, but there's, there's still another shot I need to take. There's still another uh, free throw I need to practice. Um, to use to continue on the basketball analogy. So, no, I don't. I don't have it yet. Um, but I'm striving to get to the next step. One of the things that you know, Trevor, that you mentioned that I really love um, was just you speaking about you know leadership and how the trickle down of leadership on our you know our patients ultimately and the outcomes that they have. Um, and and working in the cancer space, one of the things I would be curious to get your thoughts on is just. How do you continue to be the COO that knows like, hey, I got my eyes on the people and on my teams and empowerment, but at the same time, we got to grow this volume, you know, we got to grow our business. And at the same time, we cannot compromise on and let up on the outcomes, you know, of our patients. So for you, just as a leader, where is that balance between, you know, empowerment, your own growth, um, obviously focusing on the business and making sure at the end of the day, the people that, you know, you're there to serve the patients, you know, get what they need. How do you, how do you juggle all of that? Cause it just sounds like I can imagine it's a little challenging sometimes. No, it, it can be. I, I think at the crux of what we do, we have to keep the patient at the center of, of, of everything. As we're building a strategy for the organization, as we're developing operating plans, it has to be surrounding the particular patient. From there, it's, it's how do you empower those folks that actually do the delivery of, of the care. As a COO, I don't, I don't have the doctor hands to deliver the care. I'm not a nurse. But what I can do is understand what are the resources that the people need. Is it equipment resources? Is it uh, when we're developing our strategy, are we really looking at uh, what's the market like? Um, what prevalence of cancer do we have in particular zip codes that we're not taking care of today? How can we best serve that particular population through the work that, through the work that we do? Um, but I think in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's how are we surrounding the patient? How are we surrounding the patient's needs? And how are we developing our stakeholders to be able to meet that need of, of the patients that we have? Um, I, I think that's really the, the first step in it. Um, and, and many times healthcare has become so business driven in many cases that sometimes I think uh, we'll, we might lose sight of, of really what, what the purpose is. The, the ultimate reason for hospitals healthcare is disease treatment that's what we need to be here that's what we need to be here doing 
Um, but we have to understand who's on the other side of that disease treatment and how do we put together the resources to manage that. Um, I think we're getting better as a, as a society, as a, as a community, but we can't lose that point at the middle. Um, not that it makes it easy to take care of the patients, but I think when you have a focus of who are you doing this for, it helps you develop the what and the why. Uh, but it's, uh, sorry, my light went off there. Uh, but it's, it's really developing um, those plans to really impact the patient. But I, again, I can't reiterate it enough. Patients got to be at the, at the center of what we do. Uh, I think no it does and actually I just you know because you kind of went into another kind of segue that I wanted uh, sorry Nigel to pivoting but it definitely does I actually love the language around surrounding the patient kind of just with all the sports analogies makes me think of a huddle you know like you know what are we doing around our patient what's the play going to be you know what exactly do we need to make sure this person can get what they you know eventually want to achieve which is optimal health what are some of the things to go into kind of the disparities and equities route just for a second, what are some of the things that you at this point and at this level have observed when it comes to cancer prevention and treatment? And whether this has been, you know, from some of your personal stories that you shared or just some of the things that you, you've you seen, again, just being a chief operating officer at this point in your career. Yeah, from a disparity standpoint, I, I can't stress enough the importance of education, um, especially under under uh, certain demographics, certain certain groups and I'll use the example of my of my grandfather again, mm -hmm. who um, died of prostate cancer. And, uh, we all know that, uh, unfortunately, African American men um, die of prostate cancer at a, at a much higher rate than, than other populations. And one, I think we've got a uh, we, we've really got to educate on the importance of healthcare services. Um, I'll speak for on behalf of my father and my grandfather. Neither of them like going to the doctor um, for a host of for a host of reasons. And I think some of that comes down to, and I'll, I'll say for my for my dad, um, he's got to be the 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 man. He's got to be the guy. There's there's no weakness. Sometimes there's like a there's a thought process that if I go to the doctor, I must be weaker in my body, so I can't handle these certain things. We've got to really educate on what that is. The second part is how are we how are we how are we educating our community on uh, what they should be doing to and for their bodies? Uh, do they know that for prostate cancer, the age that you're supposed to get your first screening? Do they know that certain foods impact your body in a different way? Um, so I, th I think it's I think it's education. Um, I think we've come a long way in terms of uh, some of the healthcare reform things. I won't I won't get too political, but how are we making sure that all demographics, um, regardless of your income, regardless of of age, regardless of race, but how are we making sure all people have access to uh, what they need and You'll, you'll hear me, I won't just say access to care, but when I say what they need, I'm saying access to grocery stores, um, access to adequate transportation. Uh, it's all of those things that really make up health. Uh, because most of the time, as we talked about, it's disease treatment for hospitals. Many times, if you're having to go to the hospital, it's a little too late. How do we prevent that disease from manifesting in your body before you have to get to, get to, the, next, to the next level? What always saddens me about health is um, health is more so determined by your zip code than it is anything else. So, and we, we look at Chicago often as kind of the, the place where this happens, but within a 10 mile radius, the, uh, eight, the uh, life uh, span, it changes dramatically. Why does that happen when I'm driving 10 minutes away and all of a sudden because of where they live, they can live 10, 15 years uh, longer. And it's because I don't think we truly as a society have, have done enough to impact the things that happen before you get to the hospital. Um, and that's where I think we've got to go, not only just in healthcare, but specifically in, in cancer care as well. Um, but but how, how are we educating? How are we improving access to all those services that make up social determinants? And how are we making sure that the people that need to get to the, the services they need, that they get them in a timely fashion and in an appropriate fashion? Winston, I'm actually really glad you jumped in because my question was going to be along the same line since Trevor, since you've had an opportunity to serve in a few different metro areas across the United States, have there been differences in terms of the healthcare disparities you've seen in the populations you've had an opportunity to work with? And how have those changed your thought process as, as a healthcare leader? Yeah, I'd say they have been different. One, because um, uh, there's different race demographics that are that are there. Um, it's just different challenges among among those different groups. So it's, it's definitely different. But I think the approach is understand the demographics of the population you serve. 
once once you understand who you're serving, you can really start to work through what you need to do to um, to put that together. And I'll I'll, I'll talk. I've, I've, there's a, a a man by the name of Glenn that I talk to often. He he really talks about the uh, and I'd love for you all to look up some of the things that he talks about, but really talking about personalizing care versus standardization of care. And what does that mean when you personalize it? It's how are you getting to know the people that you that you serve? Like what are you doing to get to know them on a I won't say necessarily say a super personal level, but knowing the people you serve. Because if, if I don't know you, I can't I can't service the needs that you have. So I think what it's changed in, in my head, especially from a COO perspective, is how am I understanding the population that I serve and how am I putting together an operational plan that supports our strategy in a way that impacts those particular populations. That's different for every place that, that you go uh, because there's going to be a different demographic. There's going to be a different type of person that you're that you're serving and our operations and strategy have to ultimately reflect that. Again, going back to the patient has to be at the center. Know your patient and know what you need to do to impact that patient. Mm, that is, um, I'm getting a lot of chills just in hearing you talk because it's encouraging um, just to hear, you know, a COO, you know, obviously uh, speak like this and we or at different, you know, big academic medical centers, Nigel and I, so we kind of get a, a certain, you know, perspective of, of these conversations at times. Um, one of the things that I know a lot of health systems are still kind of grappling with is what role does the healthcare industry really have to play in addressing all this stuff? Are we the convener? Or, you know, I, you know, constantly hear that. So I would just be curious, you know, as you kind of were, speak, were speaking to all of the different things in terms of disparities, in terms of centering the patient, um, what what role do you think healthcare systems or healthcare organizations, just the industry in general, has a role in terms of really addressing some of the inequities that we see? It, it's a it's a good question, and and what I'll say again is it comes down to what what are the needs of of your particular population, and then how are you developing the strategy to come up with that need? And I was I was at an academic medical center in the past, and we start to put together these uh, collaborations between social groups and um, between uh, different grocery store partners or the local transportation uh, group. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, we developed a, a program uh, for patients that were under a certain income level that they got um, two rides per month to and from their healthcare care um, uh, provider of choice. So they would get they would get these vouchers where they got to, to ride the bus to and from um, where many people would say, hey, that's not really what a hospital does. I think in many times Hospitals, because of the things that we do, we understand the needs a little bit differently. So sometimes we are the curator of those different types of relationships. But I think I think it comes down to again, and I'll use the word again, it's the need of what of what your population needs, um, and it's figuring out a way to make that happen. So in, in many cases, what role do we play? Sometimes we are the role of the curator. Um, sometimes we are the role of treating that particular disease. Sometimes we are the role of just a connection. How are we connection, connecting this single patient uh, to a conglomerate or to a group that can help them get healthier access to food? Uh, it's why we have the social workers, the, the care coordinators that put a lot of those things together. But uh, again, it comes down to what role do we play? It's, it's what, do our, what do our patients need and how, how can we best become that point to, to help take care of that? Um, because ultimately what we want as a, as a healthcare system is, is health. Um, that's that's what we want for our population. So what are we doing in our particular spaces or through our um, our uh, relationships to help generate that? Um, so sometimes that that is our our responsibility as a as a hospital or a healthcare system. I uh, I had a bit of a different question actually. So Winston, if you have anything regarding health delivery or disparities, do you want to go ahead and get that in before I kind of switch it up to mentorship and reaching back? Oh, no, I think we're good. Let's go. Okay. Awesome. Well, well, Trevor, as we kind of talked about at the beginning, you know, we're, we're getting to that point in our careers where we still have a long way to go and a lot to learn, but we also are starting to have a lot to, to give back to those that are starting to come up. Uh, do you have any ways in which you're, you're reaching out or you're starting to be kind of the mentor and or sponsor that you talked about a little bit at the beginning of the podcast? Yeah, I, I think that's super important. One, one, I, few mentors of mine have always said, hey, you've got to reach back in the same way we've reached, we've reached out to you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's just a, a nice thing to do. I think it's my responsibility to, to do so. So not just because I feel like doing it. I, I feel like I have to because someone someone did that for me. For, for me. So in many cases, I am, uh, I've joined certain groups. There's one called, um, uh, and I've, I've got to shout, shout out Jamie Tynan who um, put together a, 
Uh, it's a it's a group. Uh, she wrote a book on it, but it's it's called 100 by 2030, and it's uh, really wanting to sponsor um, 100 minority women by by 2030. So I've, I've been a part of that group and have had the opportunity to reach back to to minority women and really help them and sponsor them in, in different different ways. Uh, but it's also I've reached out to to my graduate school uh, just to be a part of some of the things that they're doing and understand hey who's who's really wanting to move, who's really wanting to shake uh, in the in the industry, and how can I help them. How can I help them get there? Um, I, I love going to conferences and learning what people want to do in their career, uh, just so I can help them get there. But in, in many cases, it's just it's seeking that out. I, I, I really have a passion for, as we all talked about, I'm, I'm uh, going to be 30 this year. But what other people can can become COOs at 30? What other people can can do things differently? And how can we really make an impact in, in our organization? So it's it's really finding. Uh, putting myself in spaces to meet those people and, and, and helping them and, and along their particular journey. But I think it's important if uh, it would be a disservice, not only to myself, but um, but I even think to my mentors who took the time out to reach out to me if I didn't do the same for, for others. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's amazing. And we've, um, you know, Nigel and I have been privileged enough to have some great mentors, uh, folks who have joined the show um, and kind of keep that fire burning within us. Like, hey, you got to pay it forward. Like, you know, each generation has to continue to do this. And I'm just thinking, you know, some of our basketball or sports analogies, where would Kobe be, you know, without some of the folks that he got a chance to work with before getting into the league or LeBron or all these different players. So I think that's beautiful. One thing that I know a lot of our listeners are probably dying uh, to hear at this point in the episode is just all of your thoughts about age and being this young leader and how has that experience been for you? I'm not sure what the average age of a chief operating officer in healthcare is, but we know that you're dramatically um, below that, not even being 30 yet. So just how has that been for you? And just what are your thoughts on, you know, different generations in the workplace? And maybe if you have some personal stories that you could speak to, just anything related to where you're at at your point, given your age. Yeah, I, I, so I'll, I'll say a couple things. I, I think what matters, regardless of age, is, is how you lead people and, and the impact that you, that you create. Uh, I, I'll be honest, again, I'll use the word scared as I got into it. I, I knew people were going to look at me and say, well, he's the youngest guy in the room. What, what can he really do? I mean, it, it challenged me at first, but what I had to really understand was I, I'm in, I, I got in my position for a reason. So there's, there's a reason that I'm here. I don't think it was by chance. Um, I, I, I believe God helped me get in a certain position, and I think I worked to put myself in this position. So how, what do I need to do to be a better leader, and what impact can I, can I create? Um, and I really want to come back to that word impact. I don't, I don't think there's an age limit on, on impact. And uh, the analogy I'll use, you'll, you'll see my my favorite player, one of my favorite human beings, LeBron James, right behind me. And he, he entered the NBA at, what, 17, 18 years old and was expected to create an impact very early on. Uh, one of the youngest players to ever do it, he's still going. He's going to break all kinds of records by the end of his career. Um, but he, he couldn't take the time to sit back and say, well, I'm only 17. I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, I'm only 29, but I'm in the role, so I've got to figure out how can I create impact what can I do to, be, to better create the impact? And what, what things am I learning so I can be a better, a better leader in my field? Uh, I, I think as we continue to move, um, uh, kind of the baby boomers getting into the retirement age and we're starting to see more millennials really take over those positions, there's just a different mindset. And in order to really service those employees that are making up the workforce, we have to have a different, fresh um, idea around what leadership is and what we're doing in our particular position. So what I foresee coming up in the future is you're going to start to see executives become younger because we've got to service the people that are going to make up the workforce. We've got to service the, the people that are going to eventually become, become patients. So uh, my thoughts around it, um, leadership has to evolve in, in, many, in many ways. Am I saying everybody should be a 30-year-old executive? That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is, regardless of your age, what can you impact? Regardless of your job title, what impact are you making? Um, it doesn't matter if you're um, frontline, doesn't matter if you're the uh, chief executive of your company. Your, your ideas should be around, how can I be a better leader for my people, and what impact can I create in my every, in my every day? I think once you really get that, age really goes out the window um, because you're creating a positive impact. 
are there resources that you would recommend to to some of our young leaders or, or anyone listening really on on how they can go about generating that impact? Are, are there are there specific things you use? I know you talked about staying up to date on on reading and literature and all that kind of stuff. Are there specific things you would recommend out to people on how they can grow in that area? Yeah, I'd say even even outside before kind of uh, reading some of the publications, there's plenty I could tell you, plenty of books that you can read, but. I think number one is goal setting. It's um, understand what your expectation is, understand what the role of your particular uh, job is, understand what you're trying to, to do, what's, what's the ultimate why behind it, um, and really develop goals and, and set uh, plans and targets, personal and professional goals in order for you to, to achieve those. Uh, really rely on, on people, really rely on, on your mentors and uh, ask plenty of, of questions. Of course, you've got to have a knowledge aspect to it. So join organizations like an ACAT, like a NASI, uh, so you can surround yourself with, with people who have done it before, people who, who know these types of things. But I think it all comes down to what's, what's your why, why are you doing it, and what uh, tangible goals are you setting in order, to, in order to achieve that. I think that's the best way to create impact. It's um, knowing what you're doing and how you're going to, how you're going to achieve it. I actually love that. And I wrote something down that you had said right before, um, no age limit on impact. I love that mentality. Um, and that's something I think that I'll definitely take away from this conversation. Some of our listeners will as well. And, you know, Trevor, just through this conversation now and being able just to observe kind of how you carry yourself. One of the things I want to ask when it comes to all of these things that you think about as you're leading, where does your humility come from? Is it something natural or is it something that you had to build because even going back to the sports analogy, you could be the youngest, nicest, you know, most talented, you know, lottery pick ever. But a lot of times we hear now, like, Hey, it's the people who really have the whole package that really, you know, you kind of see extend into greatness. And so how did you, you know, just remain humble sometimes, you know, going through some of the things that you've gone through? Yeah, I think, I think it's a good question. I can I tell you again, I learned a lot from, from my parents, but, I think the biggest thing is uh, understanding that my, my role isn't isn't about me. Um, it, it's about the patients that we serve, and it's about the the, the people doing doing the work. Um, nothing that I do today is, is is to glorify myself, but it's to make sure at the end of the day, uh, the people that work in this organization are taken care of, and we're generating positive outcomes for for our patients. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say it's a lot of that. It's, it's understanding I'm a servant. Um, that's that's really what what my role is. It's a servant to the people that work in the organization. It's a servant to what our what our patients need. So I'd say a lot of it has to do with that. Of course, I learned about humility as as a kid and uh, from my parents and the, the the values and things that they instill in me. But it's it's understanding that I have a higher purpose. Um, my purpose in life isn't a title. My purpose in life isn't isn't you know um, the the cars that I drive. But my purpose in life is to make sure I'm impacting the population as much as as much as I can and as much as within my power to do so. Um, and I think that's what's, that's what's helped. It's that um, I want to create an impact so that there can be healthier people. There can be stronger people. There can be another generation that can keep uh, our momentum going. But um, I think, I think that's, that's, that's what it is to answer your question, Winston. I think that's fantastic. You know, I, I don't think that's a, a lesson that enough leaders share out is just just how they're able to stay humble. You know, I think it would be easy to to get the big head. You're a CEO, a COO under 30 years old, like everything seems like it's rocking and rolling from the outside. So thank you for sharing that. Um, just being mindful of time here, you know, making sure that we're appreciative of that. Is there anything that you wanted to share out with with our listeners based on based on your work, things that you're involved in at your organization, or even outside of it, and some of the things you mentioned participating in? Is there anything like that that you want to make sure that we share out to our listeners that you're involved with? Yeah, uh, one, I, I, Nigel Winston, again, want to say thank you for having having me on the, the podcast. Uh, uh, it is truly an honor and, and uh, something I'm, I'm glad to be a part of and, and getting to talk with like-minded people. So I appreciate you both for, for extending the, the invite and uh, glad I could be of some resource to, to, to the listeners as well. I, I'd say the big thing, just coming back to um, not so much, not, not necessarily age, um, but, but just, in, just in general is to um, always be working on yourself, um, whether that's mentally, whether that's professionally, Always make sure you're taking time to perfect your craft, um, really figure out what you're doing. And then ultimately, 
understand your why. Really develop that. What are why are you doing the things that you're doing? What do you want to create? What type of life do you want to create for yourself? And, and make sure that you're you're really chasing after that, um, and doing so in a in a, in a way that um, really helps your 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 community, really helps yourself, um, and helps those that are that are around you. Um, so I, I'd really say kind of those two things. And the last thing I'll leave everyone with again this regardless of age, regardless of uh, what your job title is, but always act for the role that you that you want. Um, I don't care what role you are. If you want to be a CEO, be the CEO. Be the CEO of your activities every day. Be the CEO of your particular job that you have every day. You don't need a title to to do that. Um, really play that play that part and become become that part uh, because that's that's going to be that's going to be important. Um, I think many times we get we get um, down about what our title is. We feel we may be further than than what we what we are in our careers. Um, when I would say you're you're at a point in your life because you're supposed to be at that at, at that point in your life. Um, you're needed in that particular role. You're needed in that instance for a, for a reason. Uh, so really developing that and doing that at a high level. So be who you want to be, regardless of what your what your title is. No, I love that. I think that's excellent. Um, you know, and Trevor, uh, once again, just thank you, um, you know, for coming on on the podcast, man. This has been a really great conversation. And, uh, you know, for me, I've just been, you know, reminded because there are certain things that we discussed that I definitely have talked about, I've talked about with myself, but also just a little, you know, inspired as well, because to be able to see, you know, in the flesh, someone who really has a mindset, um, you kind of wear your mindset on your sleeve and it kind of just obviously speaks to, you know, just where you are. So, uh, you know, Nigel, I think we kind of are at a point, uh, I guess, of, of wrapping it up. I didn't sure if I'm not sure if you had any, you know, rapid fire questions um, for Trevor. I have one based on some things that I read. So I didn't know when you were ready to introduce that, but. Um, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm always ready with that. <laughs> but uh, Trevor, since you've listened before, you, you already know at the end of the episode, we try to be a little more lighthearted, throw a few rapid fire questions at you. It can be about anything. Um, it sounds like Winston's got okay. one in chamber. So I'll let him go ahead and rock off with that one. And then I'll hit you with a few more after that. All right, first one, favorite Drake album. <laughs> you must obviously know i'm like a mega dress fan um uh, it's got to be take care man that's a ah, classic that was the right a, answer that's a classic um, I, I like all of drake's albums with, with the exception of a couple i think he could have held back but this take care has got to be got to be the top love it awesome love it uh what's the first thing you notice about someone when you meet him accent man it it's, comes pretty quick I, people all people always tell me what my that I, I can sometimes have a, a country accent since I'm from Tennessee but it's not as deep of a draw as someone else's so I always try to pick up where might they be from based on their accent I, I've been able to do that because I've lived all over the country now so people have different accents depending on where they are so it's funny my time in Phoenix I met a couple people and I was like you're, you're not you're not from here where are you, where are you from um, most of the time they ended up being from the south because I'm, I'm familiar with that type of accent but I always listen for for that so that's just thinking off the top of my head that's the first thing I, I typically notice once we start uh, talking mm -hmm. what's the most bizarre thing you've ever eaten oh man okay one time I went to the Bahamas and this may not be as bizarre as some other folks but a, a guy reached down grabbed out a shell opened it up just took the meat out it's, it's conch I believe is what it's called but um just took it out, cut it up, started eating it. So, you know, I start asking questions like, is that not going to make you sick? That, that's about <laughs> as raw as it gets for you to pull it out the water, cut it up and eat it. But um, yeah, I, I tried that. It, it wasn't terrible. Um, I actually liked it. It was, I couldn't get my mind around you. This thing was alive 33 seconds ago and I just ate it. Um, so that's probably the most bizarre. Wow, I thought I went crazy living in Japan when I was younger eating some fresh stuff, but that's uh, that's on a whole nother level. Uh, last yeah. one, I think I know what you're going to say here, but I feel like we got to clarify it. So is, is it MJ, LeBron, or Kobe? Come on, Come on. you see he's on the wall. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's LeBron. And this is funny because people have this conversation with me often and they get so upset because I'm, I'm always going to rock with LeBron. Why am I doing that? I think he embodies basketball. He's top 10 in three of the most important categories in basketball. 
Uh, when you you got a guy that's going to, he's about to break the record, probably another 12, 13 games uh, for points. He's already top three, I think, for assists. He's probably top five or six for for rebounds. That that embodies the the sport. Um, and even even beyond that, I think the um, here's what I'll say. I think MJ saves basketball. I think LeBron is what's going to keep it going. I like but it's that. Always, like for, that. for me, it's always going to be it's always going to be LeBron. And I'm sure in uh, in 20, 20, 25 years, there's probably going to be somebody that's better than LeBron. I'm going to be the old head that's like, no, nah, y'all don't know. <laughs> y'all wasn't alive when LeBron was playing. <laughs> I'm going to be that guy, but, you know, that's how it that's is. Real. Oh, man. Well, that's that's all I had. Winston, if you had anything else, feel free to jump in. But Trevor, thank you so much. This was an inspirational conversation. It was it was great to get to, to talk with you, to, to hear your thoughts. Thanks for all the wisdom that you shared. Um, where can people find you, uh, find your information, reach out if they want to? Um, and is there any just last words you have for our listeners or for us? Yeah, really, really for you, too. I think the, um, the inspiration is mutual. Um, appreciate you both being on. I, I love just kind of talking with, uh, especially, you know, like-minded people, as I said earlier, and, and, and learning. I'm a true believer in iron sharpens iron, mm -hmm. um, so we can all be better together. So pr appreciate what uh, you all do in your respective organizations, uh, and, and I'm inspired um, in, the, in the same way. Uh, so appreciate that. Uh, you can all reach me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, my emails are there. Uh, definitely feel free to, to reach out at, at any point. I'm, I'm usually pretty pretty accessible, but uh, definitely, definitely reach out, reach out there as well. But uh, again, I, I can't, I can't say thank you enough. Just really, really appreciate both of you for uh, taking the time today. Oh.